and good evening. You're watching The Future is Female. This is the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. I'm Melissa Idris and today I'm going to be chatting about the National Cancer Council of Malaysia, better known by its Malay acronym, Majlis Cancer National or MACNA. They have provided financial, emotional and social support to tens of thousands of cancer patients and their families for more than two decades now and for their contribution to Malaysian society they were conferred a Merdeka Award in 2020. It is considered one of the most prestigious awards in Malaysia and only in so far I think only 57 Merdeka Awards have ever been conferred in 15 years. So Magna Founded in 1995 by former Deputy Health Minister Datuk Muhammad Farid Arifin, um, it has now been taken over by his daughter Farahida Muhammad Farid, who is now the General Manager of Magna, joining us on the show today to tell us a little bit more about the good work that they do. Farah, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for making time to chat to me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so. I'm so curious to learn more about what Magna does, but um, I think at fir first I, I kind of want to get into the history bit. And I under as I understand it, Magna was born out of family tragedy, um, but you know you turned it into a way to help people, which I also love the acronym Magna meaning meaningful. Um, so maybe maybe you can tell us a little bit about how Magna began and its ethos to perhaps create meaningful impact. Thank you. Um, well, my brother had cancer at a time when in the country there wasn't many resources uh, to help him with his illness. Um, so at the time when dad was still the deputy minister of health, so he was able to garner, you know, help support from uh, other countries. So when we, and my brother was very lucky to get the treatment in London, um, and I was doing my final year uh, law at the time, so it was really um, that, that family support was there. Um, but we thought that, you know, who else can afford this kind of, of treatment? Yeah, because it, it was just, just so expensive. So it was one thing that uh, I think my mom was says, you know, when we come back, we have to give back. We do have to give back. So that's how it started. It was it just started with something that happened to the family, and and now we have helped many, many, many more families. Can we? Can we? Can I ask you uh, who are the people that Magna aims to help? Because you said that cancer care is very expensive, and I'm just wondering, is there? I mean, is the, is there a kind of target group that you aim to help uh, in terms of helping with you know cope with this disease? Well, because uh, at the time, during the 90s, uh, one of the problem was accessibility or uh, coming to the treatment centers. And banyak yang, those who were diagnosed with cancer were those who didn't have the money to even travel to the hospital. So default cases was very high. So one of the things that we decided to do way back in 1996 was to ensure that treatment do, patient do not default in their treatment. So we gave them financial help, financial aid uh, for transport costs. Um, so our target group is those people who are, who are poor, who don't have the means um, or the ability to even, um, you know, have money to buy food, okay? So now um, that we've, you know, this is our 26 years, um, we have helped, you know, now people call the B40 group. Um, so we've helped those people who are being treated at the government hospitals. We, we don't really help those in the private sector, only those who receive help in the public hospitals. So in more than 95 hospitals have referred cases to us, and I think more than 50,000 patients um, that we have helped over the years. Okay, so that's wonderful. I mean, that's financial support. Um, there's also, I understand, the other side of it, not uh, the physical support, the emotional support, the educational support. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that? Well, because we, you, you had to start somewhere, right? So that was our starting point. And then as you get in more and more into um, the industry or the universe, then you see there were so many other gaps that you need to fill. 
uh, so it just presented to us at you know at different time uh, in 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 Magna's uh, journey that there were other help that was needed, which was the cancer education. You need to improve or help with the cancer literacy. If they don't understand what they have, then, you know, them coming for cancer screening, late stages. So that was another thing that we did. So in 2007, we planned to have the mobile cancer screening, uh, mammography, free of charge. So we built that from scratch. So that was to handle the early detection of um, breast cancer, uh, cases among women. And now from one, now we have four, Sabah, Sarawak included as well, and two uh, in Sumananjo. So yeah, the whole spectrum, you know, been 26 years. So uh, the journey has been such that uh, we've been able to identify the gaps and uh, how to address those gaps in the most, uh, um, how do you say, uh, the most effective way that we know how M most pragmatic manner yes uh, can i can i ask you uh farah because you know you you talked about cancer literacy and i think one of the things um one of the reasons why there's such a high rate of fatality is because almost always it's late stage disease presentation right that and also as you mentioned poor adherence to kind of uh, uh, treatment and the diagnostic pathway. Can we talk a little bit about that, about cancer and also just health literacy in Malaysia? Because I think there's also, it's not just a literacy, but there's also kind of social and cultural taboos around cancer. I don't know whether you've come across this, but you know, in my family, I've heard before, can, you don't talk about cancer. Cancer is a subject to be avoided because it seemed to be like you're inviting the disease or you're tempting fate. Can, I mean, is that part of Magna's work? Um, well, let, let's put it this way. Yeah, um, can, Malaysia, we have you know different cultures, we have different races. So each culture, uh, each race would have their own interpretation of you know a disease, not just cancer. Uh, so some yes, get any people dengue, whatever, okay? <laughs> or but you know yeah, things like that. Um, but over over the years, uh, the literacy has has changed from um, check up from you know your your aunties or your uncles. So now with Google with technology, you know more they have more access to information. Way back in 1996, um, I don't think everybody nobody had that access to what we are able to right now. You know you can Google anything. Doctor Google is always you know there on hand. Uh, so it's a different kind of literacy right now. Too much, but like Dulu was too little. Now it's too much. Um, so uh, during the course of our journey, so yes, we see the changes and we had to adapt to it so that uh, we become, um, how do you say, at each point in the journey, uh, Magna Punya journey with the patients, and we, we grow and we learn on how to address those issues. Uh, so Dulu, yes, they didn't know where to go for the information. Now there's so many cancer organizations. Um, that can provide help or support, not just Magna. Yeah, at the local punya, um, for example, in, in Sabah, in Sarawak. Before, I don't think, way back 20 years ago, I don't think there were that many. Uh, in Penang, I think the most uh, famous one was the Penang Cancer Society that provided those kind of support. Um, so um, I think the literacy, again, has changed with, 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 with time and also people are made more aware. And then because cancer is also one of the leading causes of death in our country, so it has been a bit more put in the highlight, uh, you know, in, in, in talk shows, and you know, um, magazines. So people mm. talk more about it than, than before. Okay, that's good to know. There's a cultural shift in, you know, having it part of the conversation and a culture of health literacy. Has that translated into um, better, uh, I guess, uh, early presentation, early detection, awareness of, of early detection and the symptoms? That's such a great question. Um, it's still a third and fourth stage, yeah? We still get a lot of... Uh, uh, yeah. incidences of third and fourth state. So that's one of the roles that we play is try to present and to downgrade the uh, the stages so to one and two because if you are detected early at stage one and two, um, the cure rate is much, much higher. 
much, much higher so that the family, you know, you, 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 you can you be treated and you're cured. They you can go back to society. You know, you can start work and stuff like that. But if it is like late stages, your chances of survival is, is minimized, is lessened to maybe one to three years. And the quality of life also will deteriorate. Um, so those are the things that we try to address, not just in terms of um, literacy and late presentation, uh, mm. but also what it does to the family unit as well. If we detect late, what happens to that family unit? It's more disastrous. Okay, just a quick follow up on the early detection. I'm just wondering, what does it take to make sure that we're moving to an earlier detection of cancer symptoms? Um, I, I'm wondering what, what that would mean. How would, um, as a country, we look to shift to that? Yeah, so, um, so uh, educate people as early as possible, maybe uh, at uh, school, school going age as well. And then school make, going age? Yeah, yeah, so literacy, uh, behavior is generational. Uh, you teach somebody uh, standard one, maybe form four, form five, form six, or maybe when they go to college, well, they would change. You know, it takes time, right? So what we're trying to say is if, uh, the, earlier the, the earlier the intervention is in terms of education, uh, it becomes a norm, right? It's not something new. It's something that they, it, it's a habit forming and then it becomes something that they do as, as a normal course. Yeah, if you go to Japan, that's how it is. You know, you start everything early, you know, and then it becomes a habit and a part of the culture of, of the country. So the, that is the that should be the strategy, uh, you know, for for any non communicable disease. Yeah, you start early so that you, you can uh, at the onset of the age. Okay? Uh, when you are, uh, let's just say, um, for breast cancer, then as early as uh, maybe forty years old, then you can you start with breast self examination first. You know, at mm. the age of twenty and thirty. By the time you reach forty, you have kids, and you start you know doing your mammograms. So uh, things like that. I see. Okay, so teaching, getting the information out early, uh, having good habits formed as early in life as possible. And I, I understand that because I guess, you know, there's so many different types of cancer. And I think the, the health vigilance is something that we should train ourselves um, early in life and in the, in the family unit as well. Uh, Farah, we're going to take a quick break, but let's come back and continue this conversation. Keen to hear more about Magna's work and how the pandemic may have presented challenges in your way. All right, we're going to be back after these messages. Stay tuned to The Features Female. Hi, welcome back to The Futures Female. I'm Melissa Idris and I'm speaking to Farah Hida Mohamed Farid. She's the General Manager of Majlis Cancer National, or MAGNA. They were conferred a Merdeka Award in 2020, which is considered one of Malaysia's most prestigious awards. They were conferred under the category for education and community for the amazing work that they do, helping cancer patients with financial, emotional and physical support, but not just cancer patients, but also their families. Farah, and I want to come to that point because you mentioned a bit earlier, you talked about how late presentation can have such an effect on family members. And I want to talk about the burden on families and providing perhaps support emotionally and physical support to the family, the family unit. Uh, bef I also want to ask you whether there is a uh, gendered impact in the way uh, the, the burden of this disease is carried. Because the, 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 the work or the care of the support that we give um, sometimes are quite tailor-made to that family. Um, we, ha we don't have, so we, we haven't collected data to say that, you know, just because there's so many breast cancer uh, are women. Breast cancer presented in women are, are more. But in, for, for colon, it's more, it's, it's more or less the same, male and female. Um, but because the, the, the community that we help are B40, they're already... Uh, having financial problems. So mm -hmm. when, when a disease enters their life, 
it 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 makes it worst for for them. Uh, so what we try to do is to just um, help bridge that gap um, by providing the financial support, by emotional support, emotional support. So we have a team that goes down um, to help uh, have the home care nursing. We have our volunteers as well. Uh, so not everybody uh, uh, have, fits a certain uh, uh, right. Okay. The category so it, that we it have. It depends. It depends on the dynamic of that household, what their specific challenges are. You talked about kind of going to each household and providing that kind of care. Does that make it more difficult during the pandemic? I'm I'm guessing because you you need to be there to witness and help. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, See, when I'm talking about the from 96 something now, okay, the pandemic happened two years, right? So we've been doing the, the home visit, we've been doing that. But when the pandemic came, that was threw us off because we're so used to face-to-face care. Mm-hmm. And when the pandemic hit, everybody was, yeah, there was a restriction in movement restrictions, right? And people were afraid that we might bring the, these, uh, the virus to them. So we had to have another approach. We had to call them. It's not online. Like I had to call them, so the impact or the the assessment was not face to face. It was over the phone. So we had to change our way of doing things. Um, maybe not as effective, but the fact that they knew that we were on the other line, uh, uh, concern for for their well being, and uh, you know what happened with the pandemic. There was also um, the the floods that happened. Right. Right. So compounded lagi. Right. What happened? So every time something uh, um, uh, announcement by the government, you know, the change in government, you know, stuff like that. So that added also. Okay, uh, um, we wanted to know how the patients were doing. So we we have teams that that call the patients, and we have volunteers on the ground. So those who are in Sabah or Sarawak, they would you know do what they need to do. Um, you know, in accordance with the SOP at the time. So, so the the home care. When you talk about home care, it means that you're bringing the medicine and the care to the patient, as opposed to the patient to the hospital. Is that right? Okay. And how, why why is that better? Yeah. Um, because uh, in the setting of a hospital, there's transport costs and you know the kilometers that they have to go through. Right? They're already ill. So instead of uh, uh, helping or in their rec- recovery at the hospital, we felt it was better to help them in their own comfort of their own home. And all these services that we give, we give are free of charge. Um, so um, with the home care nursing, it's a, a team of uh, four to six nurses. Um, the home visit team is, you know, a normal officer that goes down to just assess your socioeconomic background, your well-being, uh, your mental state. But, uh, uh, and to see whether all the, the um, uh, the assistance that we give, they've received that, yeah, or anything additional. Sometimes when we go to the homes, sometimes we see other things that uh, right. that wasn't visible at the hospital. So okay. we will see that the children didn't go to school. Uh, we see that, you know, the house is um, leaking. Uh, there's no electricity. There's no water. So you see other things when you go to the patient's home. And you provide that kind of uh, uh, support or aid that is specific to that family. That sounds like a really kind of comprehensive support as opposed to just cancer care. It really feels like you're embracing the family and taking care of the family. Does Magna have the capacity to do that? There's a, that's a lot of help to be given out there. Is there, are there enough do you have the capacity in terms of teams, resources, and funding, and, and the like? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, yes. Uh, my dad always says, you know, there's a will, there's a way. So if you want to do something, you just go out and do it, uh, you know, and the, the, uh, the resources will come. You know, the fact that you want to do it, that that, that is the biggest hurdle. If you don't want to do it, yeah, <laughs> the, you know, you won't. So yes, uh, um, we we plan everything that we do. We plan, you know, the resources. What kind of resources we need? How many patients we have? How many do- nurses we need? How many doctors we need? How many volunteers we need? Well, how what's uh, the the amount of uh, budget that's required? So 
we look at all that as well before we do anything. But um, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, what we want is the help that we give is truly meaningful to the family, mm. not just to us as the people who are trying to make things better, but it really, really helps the family. So that is key for us. So. Uh, and apart from that, there's also the idea that perhaps Magna can work on cancer research, right? Cancer prevention. Uh, you have a, an institute, if I'm not mistaken, in collaboration with uh, uh, the hospital, the Chancellor Tuanku Mutres, yes, right. So um, that's part of Magna. How does that kind of fit in with the wider, wider ethos of Magna? Because uh, um, this is the other thing that we believe. We can't do it ourselves, we find a partner. <laughs> right, if you can't do right. things alone, you find the right partners. Okay, so that that was the idea behind uh, uh, collaborating with uh, with um, the, um, HUKM at the time. Um, so it, we we didn't have enough money to set up our own not for profit cancer center. So we collaborated with an already a new it was a new hospital at the time. So they had a cancer ward, but they didn't have the resources. So it was a, a marriage of convenience, and it has worked. <laughs> um, this is our, I think, 20, um, 21 years working with, with, with the hospital. So we, pro we, take, uh, um, we co manage the cancer ward and we co manage the bone marrow ward. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's a lot on your plate, uh, <laughs> Farah. What do you have? I, I'm hoping that the worst is over. Uh, in terms of the pandemic. So what do you have planned for Magna for uh, 2022 and beyond? But also what you're hoping, um, you know, our, our audience today uh, leaves this program with, the kind of message that you would like, yeah, you'd like um, viewers to take away with them. Okay. Um, so your first question um, is 2S, sustainability, succession. Um, sustainability in, in terms of, you know, you mentioned just now, can resources, can uh, mm. money, people, when you have money, then you can buy the drugs and you have the people to run the organization. Um, the second one is uh, succession. If you don't have the right leadership, we don't have the right leadership with the right values, Magna will not continue beyond uh, one generation or two generations. So the work that we do creates an impact to the country. And we think that the role that we play um, is crucial. And if we don't have the right people from now, then the organization will suffer because the, the leadership is not the right leadership. So succession 2022 is, is key with integrity, uh, the right values, the right good and truth, uh, you know, those kind being ad uh, adaptable, being resilient, um, all that. So it's just not getting people with the right skill set, but with the right attitude to Brilliant. continue. Yeah. And your message to our audience today? Um, well, I think uh, everything Maybe, starts and yeah. everything starts and ends with you. So you have to decide what's right um, for you, for your health, or for yourself, and um, the choices that that you make. So it's not upon any organization to tell you, you know, go for your screening. It's up to you. You should know your body better. So it's, yeah, everything begins and ends with you. And if you understand that, happiness is also with you. <laughs> it's true. That is, <laughs> that is very true. And on that note, I want to thank you so much, Farah, for ch chatting with me today. It's been a pleasure and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was my conversation with Farahida Mamad Farid. She's General Manager of Majlis Cancer National, or MAKNA. And that wraps up this episode of The Future's Female. I'm Melissa Idris, and I will be back with you same time next week for a new episode. Till then, take care.